Hello, and today I'm super excited to be with Paul Schirnecke. And Paul, please introduce yourself. I will do. Thank you so much for having me on, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Paul Schirnecke. I currently work at the Challenger Bank, where I am their AML strategy specialist. Uh, so that involves looking after transaction monitoring, uh, looking at items across industry, and uh, giving consideration to the best ways that we can approach our money laundering investigations. Uh, prior to that, I worked at a legacy bank for 10 years where I was involved in like more financial crime type stuff. So I did card fraud, um, complex fraud investigations, and internal fraud as well. Wow. And mm. actually, I think you've touched on it already, but I was just curious, AML, what does that stand for? Yeah, apologies. I'll try and avoid using loads of industry acronyms as we go along, but that's anti-money laundering. So that's the, the financial institutions in the UK, their method of investigating and analysing money laundering risk across their bank. Thank you. And yeah, that sounds like um, quite a role and, and really important as well. So um, as you've had those roles, and your experience in financial services. Uh, I don't know how long you've been in financial services uh, uh, in those areas that you mentioned, and how has it looked and felt as, as you've been doing that? Mm. Uh, so it's been uh, 15 years, which is not something that I ever thought was going to come my way. I stumbled into it by accident after I finished university and I needed a temp job. So I started working at this legacy bank as a temp. And then an opportunity came up in the fraud space, in card fraud team based in London. And it just, it, it felt close enough to my degree. I studied law at university mm -hmm. and I, I don't think there was ever any part of me that wanted to become a barrister or a solicitor, unless it was specifically being Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. Like that was the reason I studied law for three years. Uh, but I wanted to do something that had like that tangential element and that turned out to be fraud. And then as soon as I was in that door, I was just fascinated that there's this whole world of things. Uh, and this leads into one of the questions later on as well, that I didn't know what I wanted to do until I found this thing. I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is super interesting. And it's one of those things that on a business card or on the bottom of an email, people are like, what, what, what is that? What, what is it you do? So yeah, I feel very fortunate to be in this space. Definitely. Um, also, a little bit when I, I've learned about this area in the bank, I think there's there's a lot in there, and it's just so important. Um, uh, maybe does it does it feel quite purposeful and sort of connected with your law degree in that sense? Yeah, it does. There's there's an element of regulation and legislation that comes in. So um, within the uk uh, like the proceeds of crime act and terrorism act and uh, like the money laundering regulations as well that we have to consider so i feel like i had there's elements of the thousands of pounds that i spent for those three years that then pay dividends into what i'm doing now um but it does it lends itself a purpose and when i've spoken before to uh, elements of law enforcement in the UK. So they've come and given talks at the different banks that I've worked at. Their engagement becomes really important because you recognise that the day-to-day -day that you do as an investigator uh, actually means a lot and that it's only through this investigation function that law enforcement are then able to pick up the cases that we've looked into and that then forwards itself into becoming a full police investigation. So yeah, it does feel very linked in that way and purposeful. Yeah, thank you. And 15 years and sounds like a, yeah. a few different roles in, in that uh, financial crime compliance space. Um, how have you seen financial services evolve during that time? It's, it's interesting to have worked at a legacy bank for 10 years um, and then to have switched over to a challenger because I'd say that when, when I first started out, immediately I, I'd been informed that we were a paperless office and this was in like 2008, late 2008 I think I started. Um, and I immediately discovered that it was not a paperless office, that a lot of stuff was processed on little bits of paper and that there was a lot of opportunity for stuff to go missing or for um, something that I later ended up 
working around is like internal risk and internal fraud as well and there's so much opportunity for data to be compromised in that way it just seems really off and at odds with the way that you'd expect a bank to work so elements of that have been cleared up but within legacy banks it definitely feels like the use of technology is almost frowned upon or that the comparison i always make is uh, was it the Evergreen, the boat that got caught in the yeah. Suez Canal last year? Like that's a legacy bank. They're trying to turn around in the canal, and they're just going to get wedged there. And it's just there's no progress that can be made. So trying to turn that boat around takes a lot longer for the legacy banks to do, mm-hmm. and therefore the the systems that they use don't talk to each other in the way that you'd expect them to. Um, and there's like a million different passwords and different ways of doing things and everything's proceduralized to an extent but there's a lot of very archaic ways of working and then moving across to a challenger bank felt very different like it's my dad always jokes that all we do is like sit around on bean bags and play ping pong all day um but there is an element of that challenger bank life or startup element that is true like we all have macbooks and everyone's very cool like there, <laughs> there is a difference to it but it's all the technology and how open they are to allowing each person uh, a seat at the table to have those conversations. And I feel like that's a very different take compared to the structuralized leadership patterns that you might get at Legacy. Yeah. Oh, wow. Super interesting. And Mm. yeah, I think paper is an interesting one and printing. I definitely noticed that too, particularly with um, accounting and finance departments. If I think back to... Uh, when I started in banking, it was the that paper with like all of the lines and like yeah. sort of circles down the side, and then mm. gradually you see things evolve. And um, now, at least with what I do with consulting, it's it's rare that I use paper. It's probably more for jotting and drawing things. So yeah, it's yeah. An interesting thought. Mm. I had to I had to talk uh, a team off of using a fax machine. And I, I, like before I started working at this legacy bank, I'd never used a fax. I didn't know that they still existed. It feels like a very 80s thing. And you, you're right, like the perforated edges on that paper is very much a system of that time. And I was like, but we, we all have email at the very least. Like, why are you continuing to operate in this way? And both sides were insistent it was the other person that needed it to be on a fax. I was like, mm. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's also funny. I was- talking about faxing the other day one of my first Mm. jobs um and it was in the uk and london but not in banking it was um more uh in politics actually but a a political office um an agency but there i think one of my first jobs was sending 650 faxes um and just doing the procedure it just feels like so long ago now yeah of course and that was, that's such an entry level job as well that they were just like, there you go, give it to the new girl, get Rebecca to sort through 650 faxes. Exactly. Um, Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so, so quite the, the evolution. And um, what takeaways do you have when you look back? And you mentioned some of them, but whether they're good or bad, are, are there certain things that you think of now as, as big takeaways? Yeah, I think. I, I'm now I now feel much more comfortable about speaking up when a process doesn't make sense. I think when especially if you've come straight from education into a job, like an office based job, you just you you do your small task, you don't think about the wider aspect of that or consideration for who else that's impacting. Like it's a very silo siloed process. And I feel like maybe because my knowledge has now stepped up that I'm more inclined to look at the way that something is being done and just ask those questions, which I just wouldn't have considered when I I generally didn't understand anything outside of the immediate role and maybe my line manager's role within that. Um, And then moving across into working strategy, that's a key part of what I do as well. It's just like asking those questions and seeing if there's a better way of working. Because there are, I don't know, like 50, 60 AML investigators at the bank that I work at who are then doing the work off the back of any strategy or procedure that I put in place. So it all needs to coexist and make sense. Yeah, it's so important. And that mm. speaking up, asking questions. Um, I think with sustainability, I 
I remember someone giving me some good advice, which is um, don't self-censor. You know, there's no silly question. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, really important to to remember and ask ask those questions at appropriate times. And yeah, of course. Speak up. Yeah. And then I've heard a little bit about, about what you're you're doing and super interesting. Thank you. Mm. Um, but you also do a lot outside uh, banking as well. So I wonder if you'd yeah. share a little bit about that. I'd love to, yeah. Uh, people are always thrown that I'm able to. So I work full time and then basically all the rest of my time is given over to extracurriculars <laughs> that I do. Uh, so I'm, I'm part of an improv group. So I perform improvised comedy. Uh, we do shows uh, like three times a year maybe. And then there's a course that's run in South End called Laughter Academy, which I thoroughly recommend. And a lot of the my growth in the working world has grown as a result of throwing myself into improv and recognising that the vast majority of people don't know what they're talking about when they head into a situation, whether that's performing on stage or in a meeting in front of however many people. So, yeah, it's really helped me to develop my abilities to get up and speak and to be outspoken in that sense. So I really enjoy doing that. Um, I've had a dabble at stand up as well, but it doesn't, it's not something that naturally comes to me. It's just something that I thought would be a nice string to have to my bow. So I've got a 10 minute stand up bit that I will occasionally do at events in, again, locally, like in South End where I live. Um, but then the big one and probably my biggest passion, like if I if I could get paid to do anything, then it would be this is writing. Mm. Um, I've written I, as, as far back as I can remember, I've always written and wanted to write. I can remember having, you know, like a really early word process that you get on like the first ha uh, family computer. I remember sitting there and trying to write a story on that um, when I was very young, like under 10. And then that continued and that passion for writing has always been there. And I've done bits of songwriting as well in the past. Uh, but for the last 10 years, it's been, it's moved more into writing fiction and writing novels. Uh, so I don't know how, I know I've written at least a million words because there's an app that I've tracked it on. Wow. Which is super statistician of me. Um, but I've written at least a book a year for 10 years. And each time I've gone through the process of sending that off to an agent, so you send the first three chapters off mm. to try and gauge interest. And each time it's uh, up until very recently, it's come back and they've said thanks, but no thanks. And during the pandemic, I wrote the first draft of a book, which just felt very different to anything I'd done before and had a lot of heart to it and um, like a close family link as well. And I sent that off and two days after I sent it, I had an agent write back and say, can I read the full? manuscript which was amazing um having that in the bag i was then able to message all the other agents i was like just so you know someone's asked to read the full manuscript so then five others asked to read the full manuscript which is amazing um i then picked an agent and we've been working together for a year and there's been like different variants of the book that have existed in that time but it's currently out with publishers at the moment so we're, we're hoping that a publisher's going to pick up yeah wow yeah. i'll keep my fingers crossed and yeah thank you um yeah so interesting and i mm. I, I think um particularly with with the writing i was curious maybe you could share a little bit more about uh some of what you've written i know i've i've definitely read one of your books <laughs> yeah i know you have uh <laughs> <laughs> so so this the current book so the one that's hopefully gonna the, the hope is that this will be like a pivot point and then I can say, well, I've been writing for 10 years and maybe they'd need a, another edit or a check over, but there's this, the, these other manuscripts or Word documents that are just sat there, hopefully ready to go. Uh, so that I'm hoping this will kick open the door and then I can t continue with other stuff. Um, this one is a survivor story about, so it's told in the modern day and it's the uh, a survivor um, of a concentration camp during the Second World War. So he's a, he was a, a young Jewish man during the Second World War um, who was sent to Auschwitz. Uh, and so as a, as a character, he's fictionalized, but there is an element of fact that comes into his story. So the, the Nazis, in an attempt to bring down the British and American economies, they, I was gonna say recruited, but that's not the right word because they were prisoners. They forced 140 Jewish prisoners who'd worked in banking 
finance or even had a history in fraud or counterfeiting so this is where like the work side of stuff comes in mm. at the same time they forced them to counterfeit british and american currency in this concentration camps so they had a particular hut that was set aside it was kept top secret so none of the other prisons knew about it and they successfully forged british and american currency in this concentration camp for the nazis uh, forced to do so because it's otherwise it's a pain of death and several of them met their ends in those camps for refusing to assist or for trying to hide the money in some way or, or forego the system um and that money was then like mysteriously disappeared at the end of the second world war mm -hmm. so this book kind of sets a, a a proposition as to what might have happened to that money and then it's told through the eyes of this 99 year old jewish concentration camp survivor goodness mm. quite the story and, and drawing on i think you mentioned some of your history family history and yeah 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 so so the main character george as an old man he's based on my great grandfather who I was fortunate enough to, to get to know. He didn't pass away until I was in my twenties. So we had like a really established relationship by that point. Um, and there's a certain self-deprecating Jewish humor to it at the same time. So yeah, my mum's family are Jewish. And that is a, obviously well, like maybe the darkest period in human history, but it just, there are so many stories to come out of that. And it, it feels important to recognize and to carry those forward. So it was something that when I heard a snippet of that story, I was like, oh, why have I never heard more details on this before? And did some research and came up with this, this version of that, those events to write about. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Um, no worries. How about, you mentioned that uh, some of your other writing and, and mm. other, other books, just out of curiosity, what were some of the topics there? Um, so the first, I wrote a book of short stories uh, at first which was almost a test because i wanted to self-publish it and see how that worked th through uh, so there's a subsidiary of amazon called create space on which you can basically they'll host your book for you so there's like no overhead costs they print to order you make a very minimal amount off of any sales for it uh, but i wrote a book of short stories about my university experiences called where did all the money go um, and that was something that when, like my parents were really happy when I self-published and they were really excited and then they read what I'd got up to at university and they were like, Ooh, <laughs> a bit spicy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, so those, that and a couple of other books are available still on Amazon as well. I don't know how long I'll leave them up for if, I'm, if there's the potential that I've got like a debut novel on the way. Um, and then after that, I wrote a novel about brotherhood. So it's about it, again, like based on me and my two younger brothers, um, fictionalised versions of the three of us on a road trip to stop their dad from remarrying in Gretna Green. So they get this old car and they like drive up through the country. It's like their misadventures and reaffirming that brotherhood on this journey together. Um, and then in the last couple of years, this stuff has more pivoted into Second World War, um, which I think because of that family history and then there's family history of uh, like my, my surname is German Dutch uh, so there's a lot of interesting European history on that side of the family so I'm fascinated over the the family links that then made me exist and the fact that I live in England is almost as a result of what happened in the, the 40s as well so a lot of it there's uh, Second World War history and then elements of time like the, those seem to be the two bonding factors and stuff that i've re written recently so the idea of like characters who exist in a different time period to when they were supposed to or playing around with time so in in the book that i mentioned which i didn't even give the title mm -hmm. of it's called the counterfeiter of auschwitz at the moment um there's the aspect of it being in the modern day so you've got the 99 year old man being interviewed and then it flashes back so it's just back and forth playing with time in that way and that's definitely something that interests me and like not to the levels that Christopher Nolan does in his films but just to to mess around with time as a concept mm -hmm. is quite uh, like Kurt Vonnegut one of my favorite writers he does things in that space as well so yeah those those tend to be the things that draw my interest 
Yeah, sounds really interesting. And mm. where can people um, find more of your writing if they're interested? Um, so there's, as I said, there's a couple of books on Amazon. I also try and maintain uh, a personal blog and the contents of that vary massively depending on what else I've got going on. Uh, so that's paulshearnecker.com. Um, but yeah, there's, I think, five books up on Amazon. And I've been, I've had like some beta readers on the Counterfeit Rashes as well. So if people are interested in reading it, in its current iteration, then they can contact me directly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And hmm. I think one of the books um, was also based on on uh, some travel that we experienced together. So people yeah. can probably have a guess about what one that is. Yeah, that's true. I There was, um, there's more of those that I've just never published as well. Like each, each trek that I did, I wrote something about and then some of them have just sat there and others are made into books so yeah thanks for reminding me there's a book on the sahara uh, so we trekked 100 kilometers of the sahara desert and then there's one about uh our trek doing the inca trail to machu picchu which uh is fairly graphic because of how unwell that trip made me um and it's a a rags to riches story about someone overcoming extreme odds <laughs> to get yeah. to Machu Picchu. I think I think we might leave it there, but yeah. <laughs> I can I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I don't have to imagine because I think I might have experienced some of what happened first. Well, I did experience some of what happened firsthand. So yeah, yeah, one one to look out for. Quite the experience, mm. um, and sort of moving a little bit back towards finance again and yep. those two worlds writing improv comedy stand-up and finance and anti-money laundering and fraud investigations they feel two very different worlds so are there things that transfer between those areas and you mentioned some about public speaking yeah there's there's definitely there's stuff that transfers but then there's also stuff that is so at odds with it that i almost have to switch mentally between the two um, whenever I put a report together for like a recommendation internally as part of my job, my manager has to remind me that I've, I'm not trying to make word count. Like I, I don't have to hit a certain amount of pages for it to be successful. It's like you could say this in a much more succinct way. I was like, yeah, but the, you need the the emotion and the flowery language in there. It's like <laughs> not not doing this, you don't. So yeah, that feels at odds. Um, but yeah, I suppose the the confidence that improv has given me definitely lends itself well to having to answer questions on the spot and feeling that I deserve a place at the table. I feel like most people, I don't know if this is generational, uh, but I suffer from a bit of imposter syndrome sometimes. And anyone else that I've spoken to who, like within this startup um, slash challenger, I've, I was fairly... I wasn't one of the first in, but I was in early enough that I then was able to progress fairly quickly. And all of a sudden I was managing a team of like 11 permanent staff and like maybe eight contractors. And they were referring stuff to me. And I was like, I, I, why are people asking me these questions? This is mad. I don't know what I'm doing. But improv helps reinforce some of that and allow you to to have that space and feel like you, you can do anything because you're just playing a character. That's all it is. Um, so yeah, that helps relieve some of the imposter syndrome I feel in that space. And then I suppose the amount of time that I spend writing, just uh, trying to sell an idea is the same as trying to write a story, I guess. There's a, a crossover in that space. And then within uh, some of the ideas in The Counterfeiter are linked back to stuff that I've learned in like knowledge that I've gained through the investigations that I've done. Um, there's a whole section on like check fraud and signature fraud that exists in the book that I learned through having to analyze signatures from branch banking type fraud cases that I've investigated in the past. So yeah, there's, there's enough of a crossover there. Yeah. Interesting. And mm. yeah, I think in, imposter syndrome it's something I, I know I suffer from as well and mm -hmm. probably even more so when I when I was sort of in some of the large banks um yeah it's interesting and yeah. certainly recognize that piece around creating that 
internal buy-in and and particularly with sustainability as well it's really important to have some of those skills so interesting to hear about the the crossovers um and probably a bit more extensive than I might have thought actually and then final question um Mm -hmm. so it's been yeah 15 years financial services and 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 writing and improv and, and lots on the outside as well um if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself some advice what would you say that's a really good question I th- and weirdly I think about this a lot because I'm uh, maybe because of that thing I mentioned about being obsessed with time and people being out of time and at odds with the times in which they live in I sometimes think about uh two things either, either being able to travel back and forth in your own timeline and give yourself advice from the past or the other thing that I'm really obsessed with is um have you ever seen the tv series Bernard's Watch did you watch that when you were a kid <laughs> so Bern, Bernard's Watch uh he's able to he has a this old pocket watch and when he stops the watch it stops time okay. and sometimes I'll be in situations where I'm like oh if I could just stop time and have a nap or finish up this report without anyone having to bother me that would be a much better way of dealing with things. Um, but go, yeah, so going back, uh, the if I could travel back in time, I think the key stage that I'd go back to and inform myself would be like 15, 16 years old when everyone, all the teachers at school, and I, I don't know if this is even still the case, we were told that you had to make a choice now that would affect the rest of your life. And that's a massive burden to put on someone who it turns out is quite an anxious human being. And that's only going to exacerbate as you get older as well. And I I was like, right, if I don't make this right decision now, then I might never be happy again. It felt like it was that fundamental. And instead, what I've recognized, and maybe there's an element of improv that lends itself to this as well, is that people just find a way through. Like, I, I didn't expect to end up working in finance like it it just that still feels quite at odds with who I am as a person um and there's very little connection of that that I put out publicly like none of my social media is like I've made a great spreadsheet guys how are we doing um so I think to go back and be able to say everything will be all right you will find a way through and even I've been in situations where I've not been successful for jobs that I've applied for. I was at risk of redundancy at one stage uh, and had to like jump into another role. But stuff just continues to roll through. As humans, we're pretty resilient and you don't have to make a decision that will define you. There's very few decisions that you'd make that are, are completely at odds with being able to pursue something else in the future, maybe other than getting tattoos. Yeah, that no, is so true. I'm smiling. I, I think um smiling about the about the tattoos. Um mm. but um I think the it's interesting to go back to that point. I've never thought about that myself, but actually I had a very similar experience. It feels like there's all these really huge decisions and yeah. perspective at the time, but it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and think, yeah, I kind of needed someone to say it's gonna be okay. Don't worry. Yeah. And I I feel like I'd like to think things have expanded out now because at the time that uh, we were at school, there was no way that you could ever have made a career from just playing video games. But that is definitely a career that people now have and they make a lot more money than we do. So society is changing and all of those things are a lot more accessible. Um, But it feels like at the time that we were at school, it's very structured in the jobs that you could have. I remember doing when I was 14, making my, taking my options. So what I was then going to study at GCSE. So um, we were made to do a test, like a, a careers test, and it would then give you jobs that were applicable to your skill set. And the number one job that came out for me was a forklift truck driver. And I'm like, sure, I'd look great in a forklift truck, but that is completely at odds with what I do now 
every single aspect of my personality that does not bode well for who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. I like the structure of being really nerdy. I like being at a desk and having like my little things in front of me. Um, I've got a brother who is a lorry driver and we both have to recognize that what he does is a skill and I could not do that thing. And he has to recognize that being a little bit good at spreadsheets is also a skill <laughs> and that even if I'm sat down for eight hours of the day I'm still doing a job and he couldn't do that job and I couldn't do his job so yeah a forklift truck truck driver is a noble job to do but it's definitely not for me and it feels like being the attempt by this archaic machine to be pushed into forklift truck driving was never that that system that existed and that would have been in the early 2000s I guess does does not lend itself well to creating members of society who are thriving in any way shape or form yeah it's um i think i'm a little bit younger than you but yeah i remember those quizzes and it was this mm. sort of multiple choice thing and then it would sort of spit out what what your sort of it seemed yeah. like your destiny was at the end i can't even remember what it said for me but i'm pretty sure it would not have said anything to do with accounting or finance um yeah, because those those just aren't, it felt very much that the jobs that you were allowed to do were like policeman, fireman, yeah. doctor. Um, yeah, I don't think there was any scope of business in there. I, I, at that age, I don't think I understood what people were doing when they'd get on the train at seven o'clock in the morning and, and go into London. Like all of that kind of friends' dads did that, but I'd never understood the, the cause or what was needed for that work. But yeah, that's probably the majority of people. I live in a commuter town. So a lot of people here are, are doing that journey and doing whatever jobs there are in London. I remember. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. And I think also I'm thinking now at 15, probably a little bit younger, I certainly would have said to myself, um, pay a bit more attention in French class. Um, if I didn't have the option to choose it, but I really wish I'd paid a bit more attention. It would have, would have been a lot more... Um, used to me now and, and speaking with uh, my partner's family so there's definitely some things now I'd, I'd kick myself I wish I'd paid a bit more attention yeah did did you study any other languages at the time or you said French wasn't an option uh so yeah we had to do French at school I mm. did some very very poor German but I would say my my language skills uh, need a lot of refinement. I, I wish I'd paid a bit more attention, but mm. never mind. How about you? Did you? I So I did French to GCSE, and then I completely forgot about it. Um, and then probably in my 20s, uh, when, when I started traveling a little bit, I recognized how useful French and Spanish could be to be able to communicate in like France and Spain, obviously, mm -hmm. but then through like Canada or South America, like if you have those two languages down, then you're much more adept at, across the world. Um, so yeah, I've I've kind I've got over I've been doing Duolingo as oh, an yeah. attempt to to keep that up. Um, I'm fascinated with French culture. I'm a bit of a francophile. I love visiting Paris. So each time I go, I'll try and like push myself a little bit more and have conversations. Every single time they're going to know I'm English because it's impossible to hide how Essex I am, even if I'm speaking <laughs> in French. But at least to make that effort, I feel like that is appreciated. Um, but yeah, then, then a very limited amount of Spanish, enough to order a beer, probably. Yeah, that's... Mm. I was going to say the important stuff, but um, yeah. it's a little more practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a bit similar with my French. It's I've, I've come back to it now and I'm, I'm having lessons, but um, there's still a little bit of residual from that sort of 15, 16. But yeah, it would be a lot more helpful to my life now if perhaps there's a bit more. And I, I wish I'd paid a bit more attention with, uh, with languages. Yeah. It's never too late. Exactly, yeah. Um, well, sort of any final thoughts uh any sort of final comments otherwise we'll sort of finish up there um i i don't know because of the, that last question i just i kind of want to reiterate that if anyone's listening to this with considerations for like a big decision that it feels like is going to change their life um or if you're if you're if people are listening to this and they're trying to like find their place in the world or work out what they want to do next as a career is that everything is a step forward. There's nothing, there's very few things that you can do 
that are going to put you at odds with your own journey and where you're going to end up. I don't know if that's uh, quite as all encompassing a philosophy as I'd like to think, but yeah, that's my final thought. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate thank the you. time today and, and hearing more um, about what you do. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy sunny South End. I will do. Same for you and Zambort. Thank you. <laughs>